in theory, that would be much harder than catching in full depth squat. This is an example of the perfect proportions for weightlifting. Again, something that goes against regular physics or theory. My name is Justin Santos. I work at the Academy Alliance. I specialize in Olympic weightlifting and cover most of the barbell stuff at our gym. Basically, we're getting together today to break down high caliber weightlifters, talk about their different styles, their intensities, why they do what they do, or at least why I think they do what they do, my love for the sport, and why I think you guys should do it. We're moving on to Colombian lifter Luis Mosquera. This guy is, in my opinion, one of the fastest lifters on the planet. And another example, like Toma, of really awkward technique, like a technique that actually doesn't look like anyone else in his weight class or other weight classes, really. He has this super fast pull where he catches almost every single bar at about parallel. So it looks like he's doing power snatches and power cleans, which just means you're catching the bar higher than full depth squat. And in theory, that would be much harder than catching in full depth squat. Because for you to catch it at 90 degrees, you have to pull it, depending on how tall you are, a foot to a foot and a half higher to be able to catch it higher. Again, probably when he was young, he developed this thing where he found out that he can actually be more explosive and more stable catching at 90 degrees. And his coaches, I'm sure his some coach along his journey has probably tried to train that out of him and got him to catch full depth. And it probably affected his stability and made him really wobbly. And therefore he said, screw it, I'm just gonna keep catching at 90 degrees because I'm winning medals at the best level of the world. So like I'm competing at the Olympics and I'm battling for medals at 90 degrees and I feel better there. So I'm not gonna change that. Another example of someone that I don't think you should be copying because it's specific to him. And in theory, it's actually him making the lift harder, but it works for him and he kills it. So why change it? Again, so this is almost double the weight he was just lifting in the warm up a second ago, still catching it at that same spot super high, what most of us would consider a power snatch. But for Luis, that's, that's his ideal spot. See, and that one right there, he caught full depth, what most of us would consider the bottom, and he almost fell backwards. His body just doesn't like being down there. And like, technically, he's beautiful. Like, he keeps the bar close, his arms are long into the hips, like, his, his third pull is right up against his shirt and face, like, it's beautiful technique. He just catches high. It's the way he likes it. And when you're winning competitions, who's to tell you that's wrong? And naturally, like now that he's up at 140, I think he's a, he's a 62 kilo lifter here still. So 140 is now a du above double body weight. Like this is a huge snatch. So naturally he's getting closer to the bottom, but still like asses and on ankles, like most people and him himself included will have the mobility to get deeper if they wanted to. He's choosing not to. See, the, the, the comparison of the 110, 130, 140 speed stays the same, but now the bar weight is just so heavy that the window of opportunity is getting smaller, so he gets deeper naturally. But again, just something stylistically that you probably shouldn't be trying to copy. It's just the way he does it. So if you're one of those people who likes power snatches and is really bad at full snatching, don't use him as the excuse to never full snatch. It's not gonna work that way. He's snatching over double body weight. You're not, <laughs> it's not the same. So now we're going on to, I will definitely butcher this name, Amyun Chol. I know I'm not saying that right. <laughs> butcher me if you need to, but. Uh, I'd say Amyun Chol, Amyun Chol is how I would say that. But again, I'm not Korean, so <laughs> don't butcher me if that's completely wrong. But uh, essentially, this dude is super impressive. I said it earlier when we were watching Toshiki. I mentioned how smaller bodies moving massive weights is just super impressive to me. I've always found it cool when a tiny lifter lifts extremely heavy. I think he's a 56 kilo lifter, so like barely over 115 pounds, so a small man. And in the title of this, he's snatching 115 kilos. So over double body weight, and he's gonna clean and jerk 150, and if he's a 56 kilo lifter, a 150 clean and jerk is almost three times body weight. Like, weights that most people don't deadlift or squat, and he's clean and jerking them. Nuts. 
and like this is an example of the perfect proportions for weightlifting. Like this guy was born for the sport. Long, long torso, tiny arms, tiny legs. Like he's, he's perfect for it. On top of doing it since birth, this guy was destined to win medals. Like, so there was just a little clip right there of him taping his thumbs. If you're one of those people who refuses to use hook grip just because it's a little bit painful, hook grip is gonna be necessary for, for your future in weightlifting, especially when the loads on the bar get big enough for you to need to move hard and fast. When, when your hips are cracking into the bar with maximal force, a regular grip is going to let go of the bar and launch it across the room. You need the weight of the bar to pin your thumb against your forefingers so that the, really the only way that's gonna open up is if your thumb explodes and that's not gonna happen. So if you find hook grip painful and that's your reason for not using it, taping the thumbs is a really easy way to reduce some of the friction between the thumb and the bar and it'll make it a little bit better, but it is one of those things you should probably just get used to at the beginning of your weightlifting career so that you don't need to get used to it later. So <laughs> there is sometimes with hook grip, they'll get, you'll get a little bit of like pigmentation issues on your, on your thumb. And I've heard, the funniest way that I've heard it explained to me is someone telling me, I don't want to eat hook grip because I don't want my, I don't want to have a poo thumb because it'll make it a little bit brown. But like, again, to get a brown thumb from hook gripping, you need to be a certain level of weightlifter. And if you are that level of weightlifter, you probably don't give a shit anymore. So like, just to use your hook grip, please, because it's better than you launching the bar into your coach's face. So how do you warm up for a snatch? Yeah, so my, my warm-ups for snatch and clean and jerk and even squat a lot of the time are going to be really, really similar. Uh, regardless of the session I'm walking into, I, my warm-up is more based about areas of my body. I like to move my shoulder blades a lot. I like to move my spine. I like to move my hips and my ankles. Those four areas, to me, are what kind of constitute stability and mobility in weightlifting. Like, obviously, you want the spine to be stable. You want the shoulders to be stable. So for those two things to be stable through the ranges of motion, what would need to be mobile? I need my ankles to be mobile. I need my hips to be mobile. And I need my blades of the shoulder blade to be mobile as well so that the shoulders, spine can both be stable. So for me, regardless of the lift I'm warming up for, it's shoulder blades got to get a ton of moving around. My spine's got to move around a ton. My hips got to feel amazing. They got to be loose and, and, and fluid for better word than loose is fluid. And uh, my ankles got to feel fluid as well. As long as those four areas are moving well, I can, I can kind of jump into my session and slowly warm up with the bar and go from there. Let's say I get to, I feel like I'm okay and I start to move my bar. So I'm doing those first few snatches of the session and I notice, man, my uh, left ankle is hurting today or maybe my left hip is hurting today. I'll actually regress from the bar back to my body weight or kettlebell style warm ups, and I'll get whatever part of my body that's feeling off to feel fluid before I come back to the bar. So again, hips, ankles, shoulder blades, and spine. Those four parts of my body have to feel perfectly fluid before I jump into a session. Why is he dropping a bar? This is such a Korean thing. Korean lifters do this a lot. Japanese lifters do this too. It's almost as if they're saving a little bit of their legs by not standing up. The point for him at this weight is to just make sure that he's getting the bar overhead in that perfect stable position. And standing up for him is literally a waste of energy because once it's stabilized overhead, he is not worried about standing up with 100 kilos. He knows he can stand up with 100 kilos. So he hits the bottom, feels it locked out in that perfect position and just drops it back into the, the first pole so that he can start the next rep. Saving enough energy to be maximal later on because once he's got it in the right spot, he's not worried about standing up. He already knows he can. Does that mean I can start using that excuse? Yeah, so I was about to say, like, if you're one of the, the people who, again, is going to take something that's done at an elite level and want to uh, recreate it in your own training, I don't think anyone who's not snatching double body weight yet should ever not be standing up snatches. If you snatch double body weight, do whatever the fuck you want. Like, you can catch the snatch and return it back to the bottom. But if you don't have a double body weight snatch or even a 1.5 times body weight snatch, you should be practicing standing up. None of you are training hard enough without that double body weight snatch to need to save energy by putting it down on the floor without standing up. Like just no wasted space on this dude's lift. 
fast as lightning, the bars right up against his body the entire time. No wasted space. And that's just a lifetime of practice with the genetics for weightlifting. It's just a perfect mix. Okay, so this next lifter is from Taipei. I included her in this one just, just because I, I love her technique. Again, I'm gonna butcher this name. I would say something like Sing Chun Kuo is how I would say that. She's, I believe, another 64 kilo girl. And I just love her technique. Very similar to the gentleman we just watched. Uh, almost no wasted space. Bar right up against the body the entire time. Almost no separation from the bar. Like, no wasted space is like the perfect way to describe it. Just doing a very general warm up. Making sure the shoulders feel good. Stretching out the ankles a second before that. Making sure the front rack feels good. It's basic stuff. Rotating the spine, making sure the spine doesn't feel locked up in any spot. Again, that's pretty universal. Shoulder blades, spine, hips and ankles. And I find in general, the uh, female weightlifters tend to have better technique. And I think it's just because their bodies are smaller. Like, the, a lot of the time, the weight classes are smaller than the male weight classes just because the bodies don't get as big and muscular. So with, with that lack of body weight, you have to make up, make that up somewhere. Because again, mass moves mass. So with the smaller bodies, you tend to see cleaner and more crisp technique because they need to rely on technique because they don't have, like Lasha, a massive 160 kilo body to be throwing against the weight. When you're this small, you have to be efficient, essentially. And efficiency is based on no wasted space, perfect technique. And again, stylistically, it's funny because when she recovers the jerk, like when she brings her feet back together, a lot of the time she'll bring them together almost touching. And I don't know if that's something that she does or if that's something that she was taught, like right there. I don't know if that's something she does or something she's taught in her system. But I've heard other weightlifting coaches from other systems talk about recovering to a base that's about shoulder width because wider base equals more stability. But again, something that goes against like regular physics or theory that seems to be sound, but then is gone against at the highest level of the sport and seems to still work. And it's just things to take into account that, and what I'm getting at is there's not one way to lift the bar. You're gonna see different things when you're working out in your CrossFit gym or your weightlifting gym, and you look around the room at everybody who's lifting. Not everyone's gonna look the same because they're not supposed to. Depending on how you're made up and your little quirks and the way you move, that determines what you look like as a lifter. There's the basic technique that everyone should start with, but then deviating from that as you go along your lifting career or your lifting life is, is totally normal. And having a good weightlifting coach that can like differentiate what's detrimental and what's okay to allow is super important. Otherwise, you start allowing things that are actually detrimental, thinking it's just my quirk, when really you should be fixing that. Having a good coach will help you determine what to fix. Like how she puts it on the blanket every single time. Every time. And like you'll notice with higher level weightlifters, even some amateur weightlifters, weightlifters in general, are super like ritualistic. The things they do before the lift and the things they do after the lifts are literally almost always the same. And I think that ties into the dance step thing that I've mentioned so much as we've uh, been talking today. The things you do between the lifts sometimes are almost as important as what you do in the lift. Just to keep your mind clean and, and to not have useless thoughts in there. Like, beautiful. That, that's in front of the judges, competition lift, so it's now like basically the, almost the heaviest this girl can lift because it's in front of judges and it, it's technically sound. It hasn't changed from where she was in the warm-up. Like, super solid. And her third jerk is better than her second. Second jerk took, to, took her forward a little bit, must have talked to her coach, made some sort of technical adjustment, or maybe just tweaked what she was thinking about. The third jerk, which was a heavier jerk, lands perfect, doesn't take her forward. Slight adjustments, top level athletes, perfect.
So now our next lifter is gonna be Maddie Rogers, basically America's poster girl for lifting. Poster girl for a lot of reasons. Her technique is super clean. Her background I think was cheerleading, which makes total sense for Olympic weightlifting because again, cheerleading is choreography and then managing nerves and nailing that choreography regardless of how much nerves you got going on inside, that's weightlifting. Remembering your muscle memory, remembering your choreography within the lift, and then performing that choreography regardless of the weight on the bar and regardless of the magnitude of the stage you're on. You'll notice that with a lot of the higher level athletes that are um, still going through the developmental stages of their lifting, like Maddie, like she's still young, she's still got years of lifting ahead of her. So when you get a lifter like that, who's good enough to be at the top level of a weight class when they're young, and you're watching them develop as they get older and like kind of fill into the sport, notice that a lot of the time they'll gain weight because the ceiling for how much you can lift at a given body weight eventually caps out. Once you get to two, 2.5 times body weight snatch, that's the ceiling for that weight class. And once you get to three times, maybe 3.25 times body weight clean and jerk, same thing. You're kind of reaching the peak of like human ability for the size that you are. And it, once you're one of those athletes who realizes, crap, I've gotten as strong and as fast as I can at this body weight, but I feel like I can still get better. The only option at that point is to gain a little bit of weight because mass moves mass and gaining weight will, will therefore raise the ceiling. So again, if, just keep that in mind. If you were to look at this video, 2017 World Champs, but then look at a 2020 video of Maddie, you'll see a perfect example of that. For her to be able to put more kilos on the bar, she had maximized her size as this lifter. She had no choice but to gain a little bit of weight to therefore raise the ceiling. And she, her technique has come such a long way too. Like she, her technique is really crisp here, but she gets so much better at keeping it close and following through. Like I, I, she had an Instagram video maybe three or four weeks ago where she talks about working on, on making every joint work within the lift. So like as she's extending, really focusing on the knee, hip, ankle, extending through the floor, talking about how the wrist, elbow, and shoulder should be following through, and making sure that every joint is doing what it's supposed to. And that's one of my favorite parts about Maddie. She's always been really technical and, and not scared to dive into where she can get better and being hypercritical of herself, which is dope. And because there's no language barrier, because she is American, she's able to uh, talk about it in a way that, that we can understand and, and break down and resonate with. And the cheerleading background just brings a little bit of swag to the way she does things. The little hair flip at the beginning, like, she's cool. So again, she finishes her warm up for the snatches, comes out to the competition stage, lighting is a little different, there's judges now, so it, it just becomes a, a, a different type of feel. If you've never competed before, your first lift on a competition stage is, is a little bit intimidating. There's no music. Like in CrossFit competitions, a lot of the time there's an awesome playlist going on in the background. At a lifting comp, you can literally hear the electricity buzzing through the light bulbs. It's, it's a very different environment. Yeah, almost no bar separation right up against her body. And again, like notice how the bar came off of her hip and then there was like a good foot of separation between her and the bar. Like a, a video of her now, that separation is way less. Like just off of the three year difference, she's gotten so much better. See, and the reason that bar went behind her was because of that separation. Like the further the bar is behind you, when you decide to get under it, it's gonna wanna keep going that way because of that separation. And again, if you watch a video of right now, that separation has gotten much less. So the bar gets stripped back down. Just make sure the front rack feels good. Just starting to warm up for the clean and jerk. In the bottom right, you'll see the timer where it's like she's got about 36 minutes before she's got to be out for her first competition clean and jerk. And I think that's pretty, like, again, depending on the size of the competition, it might be longer or shorter, but usually you get at least 20 minutes to a 40 minute buffer between your last snatch and your first clean and jerk. Okay, so like this is an example of like, honestly, in my, in my experience, one of the worst feelings ever. When you're in the warm up area, lifting a weight that's still lighter than what you're about to try and do in front of judges and having it fail, it's, 
it can be confidence shattering. And what they're gonna instinctively do is, is have her lift a lighter bar, or actually, they left a 115 kilo bar prepared in the back. In case she misses this, she'll immediately go back to the back room where the weight is significantly lighter and get her groove back. They literally left the lighter bar loaded in case she butchers this so that she can go get her groove back right away. And this is where, as a lifter, muscle memory and like your dance steps need to be memorized. Because if you're thinking about technique in this moment, there's no time. Like, you gotta just know what you're doing. Have like one or two thoughts in the back of your head and then thinking about being aggressive. That's the only, there's only really room for that at this level. See, and that's exactly what happened to her in the warm up. Got pinned about halfway through the clean. No. And this would be an example of my, my first weightlifting coach, Alex Varbanov, would have said, need more legs. Like, and again, why squat is king for weightlifting. If you deadlifted it and got it on top of your shoulders, you need to have such excess leg strength that you're going to stand up. And getting stuck like that in the middle of the squat is just a sign that she needs to go get a little bit stronger. I hope you enjoyed me breaking down the lifts and just kind of chatting about the philosophy of weightlifting and kind of how I see the sport and some of my favorite athletes. If you have any videos that you'd like to see broken down or if you want to see me react to a specific lift or a specific lifter, send us a message or link us the video and let us know and we'll be happy to, to check it out for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you liked what we talked about today and hope to talk to you guys again soon. Thanks.